Hello and welcome. Today's webinar is Planning and Development in Gateway Communities Post-COVID. My name is Lacey Friedley. I'm the Communications Coordinator at Portland State University's Transportation Research and Education Center. TREC leads the National Institute for Transportation and Communities, a university transportation center funded by the U.S. Department of Transportation. NITSI consortium members are, in addition to PSU, the University of Utah, University of Oregon, University of Arizona, University of Texas at Arlington, and the Oregon Institute of Technology. NITSI's research priority is improving mobility of people and goods to build strong communities. Our presenter today is Dr. Philip Stoker of the University of Arizona. Dr. Stoker is an assistant professor of planning and landscape architecture in UA's College of Architecture, Planning and Landscape Architecture. He holds a PhD in Metropolitan Planning, Policy and Design from the University of Utah, where he completed his thesis on urban water use and sustainability. His academic foundations are in ecology, planning and natural resource management. He has conducted environmental and social science research internationally, including work with the World Health Organization, Parks Canada, the National Park Service, and the Vancouver 2010 Olympic Games. Before diving into the presentation, I'd like to let you know about a couple more upcoming NITSI webinars. On May 18th, Sarisha Kuturi of PSU and Taylor Lee of the University of Texas at Arlington will present Advancing Pedestrian Safety Using Innovative LiDAR Sensors. On June 8th, Rebecca Malden, Stephen Mattingly, and Rupal Parekh of UT Arlington will share research on transportation resources and behaviors among older immigrants and migrants. Today's presentation will be about 40 minutes long, then we will have 15 minutes to answer your questions. During the presentation, please submit your questions via the Zoom Q&A. After the webinar, you will receive an email with a link to the video recording and presentation slides. If you are tracking professional development hours, this webinar is eligible for one hour of continuing education credit. A certificate of completion will be posted on the event page within 24 hours after the webinar ends. And with that, I will turn it over to our presenter. Great, thank you, Lacey, and uh, hello, everyone. I'm glad you're all here. Uh, my name is Philip Stoker. I'll be presenting today on NITSI-supported research uh, that we're calling Rural Gentrification and the Spillover Effect, Integrated Transportation, Housing, and Land Use Challenges and Strategies in Gateway Communities. So my name is Dr. Philip Stoker. I'm an Associate Professor of Urban Planning at the University of Arizona. Uh, I would just like at the beginning to highlight uh, the work that my colleague, Dr. Dania Ramore at the University of Utah has contributed to this project. It's very much a collaborative uh, project. And so I'm the presenter today, but just at the beginning, I'd like to acknowledge her contributions to uh, all this research, research as well. So I'm coming to you from Tucson, Arizona today. Uh, so I teach courses in the College of Architecture, Landscape Architecture and Planning. This semester I have a class uh, called Environmental Planning, where we've got masters of graduate students uh, in urban planning, and then upper division undergraduates. But at the university, I also teach classes like Sustainable Cities and Societies, Introduction to GIS and Research Methods. And I took this picture just outside of Tucson just over the weekend. Uh, so just a little idea of where I'm coming from for this presentation. I'll be talking about gateway communities today. And I think the most succinct way to understand a lot of what I'll be talking about today is I'm talking about small towns with big city problems. We'll be looking at a range of these communities, uh, but I think this is a nice succinct way to understand it. They're small towns with big city problems. I'll be showing you the results from a NITSI funded final report, and then we'll also make that available to you on the NITSI website. Hopefully after today's webinar, you'll also be familiar with some useful sources of public data. I'm gonna pause a few times in this uh, talk and have you start working with some data. Uh, it's publicly available, but I don't think it's well advertised or known. So hopefully you learn a few more sources of data. I'm ideally going to raise awareness of these challenges and opportunities in gateway communities. And if you are interested in this topic or you work in communities where this would be useful, uh, I'm, I'm going to also provide resources for further connections, how you can become more involved with the network of researchers and other communities looking at these issues. So I'll be talking about gateway communities, and I want to kind of clarify that term. Uh, when I say gateway communities, 
The gateway is they are a gateway to natural amenities. So they're proximate to nice natural amenities that are attracting people to live there. It's a wide range of small rural communities in the Western US. We're focused just kind of on the Western US right now because there's so many national parks. There's so much federal and public land. Uh, these rural communities are also a long ways from any urbanized areas or metropolitan areas. So in some ways they're different than communities on the kind of the Eastern part of the US, even though we recognize there could be some similar communities. We're looking at smaller towns, so between 500 and 25,000 in population, uh, 15 miles by freeway uh, from an urbanized area. And then the natural amenities that we measure are that these communities are within 10 miles of national parks or monuments, national forests, state parks, wild and scenic rivers, reservoirs and lakes, and ski resorts. So based on this criteria, we've identified 1,857 census-designated places that meet this criteria. And we are calling these gateway communities for this research. Right at the beginning, though, I really want to acknowledge that we know this is a range of different types of communities. They're not all the same. They face different challenges. There are different stages of growth. Uh, and I'll lead in this uh, webinar to the need for better kind of types of gateway communities and a better understanding of this variety. But just so you know, we'll be calling all of these gateway communities, even though we recognize there's some variety in this class. So gateway communities really kind of got some international and national attention during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, when people working in cities were forced into remote work, uh, there was lockdowns, a lot of people decided that they could do their remote job living wherever they wanted. And so these people were able to move to uh, what started to be called Zoom towns uh, in order to do remote work and then have a nice high quality of life with access to natural amenities. So here I've grabbed two um, newspaper headlines. Oh, first one is from Forbes. It says, Zoom Towns, why your last vacation getaway may be your next home. So this article talks about that phenomenon of remote workers, they call it fleeing uh, to uh, these kind of nice communities so that they can work and then enjoy all the amenities of these small communities. This other one was in the BBC. As remote work takes hold, rural Zoom Towns are popping up all over the US. For outdoorsy workers, the options are an embarrassment of riches. Uh, this headline kind of made me laugh. Uh, it says they're popping up all over the U.S. Uh, these communities weren't popping up. They were there for a long time. It's just the attention to them started to increase. And we were anecdotally hearing about kind of mass migration to these gateway communities, both from tourists and kind of new residents. And the concern was that these high income earners would move to an affordable rural community for their natural amenities and still pull in their income from a larger city. This would absolutely put additional pressure on housing and transportation in these communities. So this occurred right as we were starting this stage of our research. So you'll see we asked a lot of questions from these communities about how did COVID-19 impact planning and development in your community. But we were also researching these communities before the COVID-19 impact. And here were some of the kind of challenges that we were hearing from them, that there was already a lack of affordable housing. There was already a displaced workforce, that they were constrained by limited city budgets and staff. Uh, some of these communities had traffic crowding and their workforce had to go through long commutes. Some were reporting environmental degradation and most were very much concerned about losing their community character. They value this small town feel and then with the rapid growth, they were losing some of that. So we were hearing these problems before the COVID-19 pandemic. And so uh, again, these communities weren't popping up. It's just they got a lot more attention after the pandemic. So our research is very much aimed at supporting these communities with data, strategies, and research. We are trying to better understand the interconnected issues of housing, transportation, and land use issues in these types of communities. And so NITSI has been tremendously supportive and helping make this research possible. Uh, we've done about four years of funded research because of NITSI. And what we're really looking at now also is trying to answer, are these local or regional issues? And this is a little bit of foreshadowing here. Uh, th there, these are regional issues. Uh, I'll be talk, showing you kind of the regional nature of commuting. Uh, and I think it points to the need for communities not to just kind of be on their own, but to try to engage in more regional planning so that they can get a better handle on some of these problems. And then we also uh, try to measure the impacts of COVID-19 on these gateway communities to go beyond just the anecdotes from the newspaper articles. 
So over the last couple of years, we've done a few things to advance these research goals. We've done a questionnaire of public officials in gateway communities. We've done four case studies of different gateway communities. We have conducted analysis of publicly available secondary data. We've done online community workshops and informal public interviews or public official interviews. And then we're also going to draw upon our previous NITSE supported surveys and interviews to kind of present all these results and add some context. So a lot of the data that I'll be showing is coming from the questionnaire. So everyone on the webinar, if you want to see what that questionnaire looks like, I'm showing you the QR code on screen. You can just go ahead and scan that. That'll take you to a sample of our survey. So if you want to take a moment here and just scan that with your phone, you can see the survey we used. Uh, you don't need to worry about messing with our data. This is just a copy of it. You can complete the survey if you're interested or just kind of breeze through it so you can see all the questions that we asked. But we asked 42 questions. We use the Qualtrics software, and the survey is organized into a couple sections. So there's the initial screening section to make sure we're getting the kind of the right kind of respondents, public officials working in gateway communities. Then we ask about community challenges that they face. We have a section on housing and how housing has changed in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. We have a section of questions on transportation, and then the survey ends with planning strategies. And finally, we did a prize drawing to kind of incentivize people taking the questionnaire. But again, feel free to scan this QR code. Uh, that's the exact survey we used, uh, but feel free to take it and see what we've done. About a year ago, we started administering this questionnaire, and we began with our list of 1,857 gateway communities that we had previously identified. Our team of hardworking undergraduate assistants then, with that list of 1,800 communities, went through each one of them and tried to find a publicly available email account of a public official in that community. So they got on their websites, they looked for mayors, planners, city managers, a public official who would be knowledgeable about that community. And they found uh, 1,153 public official emails. This was our sample frame. We then administered the questionnaire over a couple months with several reminders. And at the end, we received back 235 completed questionnaires. And this map that I'm showing on the right shows the locations of those communities who responded. If it's a polygon or a, a kind of an outline, that's a county. If it's a point, that's showing the, the census designated place. The respondents represented 11 different states, 151 cities and towns, 42 counties, one regional organization, two tribal organizations, 13 other, and in total, we received a response rate of 17.6%. Majority of the respondents were working as planners, so they self-reported as planners. Uh, then it was followed by economic and community development directors or county managers, clerks, elected officials, administrators, and so forth. 73% of the respondents represented city and town government, 20% represented county government, and the rest were regional, tribal, and other forms of government. So when I'm presenting the, the perspectives of these respondents, keep in mind these are public officials. We didn't go out to the communities and ask the residents. We're talking to public officials, and our results, therefore, are the opinions of these public officials. We also draw upon a secondary data set that we built up, or publicly available data, for these 1800 communities. So for all of them, we've gathered census data. We have a whole lot of variables about housing, demographics, employment. We also took multiple data points across time so we can measure rates of change. For example, what is the rate of change of second home ownership or population growth for all these communities? We added in commuting data so we understand a little bit more of the transportation dynamics for these communities. We have land cover data, and then also the proximity to which kind of amenities. As part of this NITSE project, we trained and supported students to conduct case studies. So these are student-led case studies of gateway communities, where my colleague Donya Ramore taught students in a spring 2022 course at the University of Utah, kind of some skills in interviewing, uh, skills in how do you conduct case studies, and then a lot about the content of the challenges that gateway communities are facing. So we help partner these students with community members or community leaders, and then over the course of that semester, they conducted case studies. This involved conducting interviews, collecting planning documents, and then writing them all up at the end. And we were able to include much of this in our final NITSE report. Here you can see one of the students' nice final uh, poster presentations. 
She was working in uh, with the city of Moab, Utah, to gather really good data through interviews, and we are able to use that as part of our research as well. Then finally, our kind of outreach program is called the Gateway and Natural Amenity Region Initiative. This is housed at Utah State University. But through this organization, when we began our project, we did a couple of informal interviews with these partners of this initiative, as well as a kind of um, uh, workshops throughout the project to share and get feedback on our approach and results. So we tested some of our questions with them informally. We asked their opinions on our research approach, and we were getting feedback from these professionals throughout. So this kind of constitutes all the data we had that we're using to generate results for this webinar. For the, for the rest of the time, I'll be focusing on our findings from this research. Uh, this will include the challenges that the communities face. I'll talk a little bit about housing and how COVID-19 impacted population change as perceived by these public officials. I'll talk about trans, transportation with a real focus on commuting. And I'll even show you how you can you're interested in measuring commuting patterns in your communities, I'll show you a good public, publicly available data source to help you out. So this first set of findings comes from our questionnaire where we were asking respondents to tell us what were the challenges that your communities are facing. And one of the first clear trends was that provision of basic infrastructure is challenging in these small rural communities. Over 20% of respondents indicated that each of the factors is very or extremely challenging. And here you can see in this figure the different factors. So I've organized it from the top of the list as the most commonly reported and most severe challenge to the least commonly and least severe challenge. So most of the kind of consistent across all the communities, respondents indicated that provision and maintenance of basic infrastructure, a lack of developable land, and then community conflicts over density of development were challenging development issues. We saw this very much expressed in one of our case studies when our student was talking with representatives from Moab, Utah, one of the gateway communities. They were telling us about their challenges of managing wastewater, uh, managing wastewater in the city. So they'd have really busy weekends where a lot of tourists would come in, their population had been growing. And when everyone was in those hotels and some of the new hotels using water and flushing their toilets, they were struggling to keep up with all that wastewater production. And so this was a huge concern because what's pretty critical infrastructure in a city. And I think this is just one example of how what we're seeing in our broad survey results is that provision and maintenance of basic infrastructure is challenging for these communities. We also could clearly see that a lack of local resources uh, in local government is a challenge for these public officials. We got some write-in responses that kind of capture this sentiment where they had challenges finding resources to update water and wastewater treatment facilities. Uh, they had challenges fund to get funding to update the general plan. And then just thinking across the city, they were even having a hard time retaining people to work in their city because of insufficient in essential services like grocery stores, barber, hardware stores, et cetera. So this is a similar graph that you're seeing in the upper right. It's showing the different factors that then we asked the respondents how severe of a challenge it is, where you can see the most commonly reported challenges related to governance issues are lack of government resources and revenue, difficulties associated with local government employee recruitment and retention, and then insufficient local government staff and capacity. We see this as a need for more support for these communities. So if they have a limited planning staff, our research is absolutely aimed at trying to help provide sample ordinances, help provide best practices, these things that uh, can really be accomplished by being part of a network. Finally, the big one, and this is exactly what we saw in our 2018 research, is the most commonly and most severe challenge that all these communities are facing is a lack of affordable housing. It's uh, nearly identical results to our survey that we did in 2018 before the COVID-19 pandemic, and that, that certainly didn't uh, change the severity of this challenge. When we, in our interviews, it was really clearly tied to the imbalance of local wages to the relative cost of living. And the most extreme example we came across was in our case study of Aspen, Colorado. And you can really see this imbalance of local wages to the cost of living uh, in some of their census uh, data. So the median income in Aspen, Colorado is $74,000 a year, but the median home price is $4 million. So that is a, there's quite a discrepancy there. 
We heard in our case study that the city estimates that it has a deficit of 4,000 affordable housing units. And this is pretty severe, especially considering the year round population is less than 8,000. So again, they think there's a deficit of 4,000 affordable housing units in their community of less than 8,000 people. So this is a major challenge and it's commonly reported. So not all communities were quite as extreme as Aspen, Colorado, but if you see in this graph, the, the majority of respondents indicated that it was extremely challenging or very challenging. So we dove into the kind of, we wanted to know more about this. We saw this coming. So we had questions on our uh, survey that we're trying to get at, why do you think uh, providing affordable housing is so challenging? So we asked the question, what factors are making it more difficult to live in or near your community? Interestingly, uh, and you can see here in this table, our scale goes from one, not at all, a factor, to five being a great deal. The most uh, severe problem was listed as other. So we interpret that as, that likely reflects the complexity of this question. There's no one factor that makes it difficult to live and work in or kind of near that community. Rather, it's all these factors interacting. And we had one right in response from a respondent that, though grammatically not perfect, I think really captures the sentiment here. And so this is what they wrote when asked what factors are making it more difficult. He said, COVID equals driven migration from wealthier areas of the nation are driving 50 to 60% median home prices over the last year, kicking out tenants, converting to short-term rentals. There's a lack of county and town consistent stance on short-term rentals for our small community of 12,000. So we really think this is this is a complex issue of interrelated factors, and that's why we saw other place so high. But right after that, we see increasing residential property values, shortage of long-term rentals, costs of long-term rentals, and then a lack of diverse housing options. So again, ties back to this lack of affordable or workforce housing, it's really causing people not to be able to live and work in their communities. We then asked them, well, what strategies are you implementing? Because you know this is a problem. What are you doing to try to alleviate this challenge? Uh, interestingly, uh, only 13% of respondents indicated they thought their community was doing enough. So the vast majority of the communities don't think they're doing, uh, as public officials, enough to provide affordable housing in these types of communities. But we did a count of what kind of housing strategies were being implemented in these gateway communities, and that's what this table is showing. So the most commonly reported strategy was allowing or encouraging accessory, accessory dwelling units in their community, changing zoning to allow for more density within the community, and then regulating short-term rentals. So those were kind of fairly commonly implemented, but the key message here is most of these public officials don't think they're doing enough to provide affordable housing. So we then asked them what would be helpful resources to help address the housing challenges. And so this was a write-in response. So in this table on the right, you can see some of the responses from the, uh, the people who took the survey, and they kind of fell into larger categories of changes to mandates and laws, publishing best practices, providing more funding, increasing planning capacity, some sort of regulatory, regulatory reform, and better data. Uh, these are really good insights. I, I really like the write-in responses from this questionnaire. So I'm just going to highlight a couple of these. So the first right in response related to changes to state mandates and laws. One person wrote a strong state mandate that forces all communities to have affordable housing. Another wrote the state needs to step up and require commercial property taxes for short term rental properties. Then a little different, the state needs to stop implementing regulations that one don't apply to our community and two hamper our progress ability to address our situation locally. So we're kind of almost seeing contradictory feedback. And then get rid of state laws restricting the city's ability to enforce short-term rentals. So we did not get clear guidance on how to formulate these state laws, uh, but a lot of respondents thought the state has a major role to play. There was a call for more best practices, where an assessment of best practices around the country. There are many different programs being used. It'd be great for someone to summarize them all and analyze which ones are most effective to use. Another wrote case studies from peer communities in other states. And then finally, we lack adequate staff. Therefore, any boilerplate ordinances, applications, tax incentives, et cetera, that might be applicable to a tiny rural town would be helpful. We're hoping to do this with our research and our outreach through the Gateway Natural Amenity uh, Initiative. 
So that was a little some of the, the findings uh, related to housing. In our report that will be available on the NITSI website, we go through every single question and all of the findings from those and then provide every single write-in response as well if you're curious for more of those findings. Uh, but I want to kind of move over to thinking about transportation and gateway communities. This picture captures uh, visitors to Arches National Park outside of Moab, Utah. And this is a pretty common site. Uh, this is a little outside of town, but you get this long line of tourists lining up to get into the national park. Moab serves as the gateway to this national park. So a lot of these visitors will go and stay in Moab and was part of the problem that kind of stressed their wastewater management in that community or causes traffic on their main street. So just one example of a, some of the transportation challenges that gateway communities can face. We saw a range, again, so we, we've captured a really wide range of types of communities. So not every small rural town is saying that they're congested and that there are long commutes. But cities like Moab and Springdale outside of Zion National Park frequently deal with congestion because the main street is also a state highway. So as even just commuters or trucks are going through, they might not be stopping in that rural community. If the main street is a state highway, that can really contribute to traffic uh, in that community. So in our case study of Sandpoint, Idaho, they did create a bypass route and they reported that it was politically challenging and costly, but did alleviate some of the traffic challenges. Uh, this is not a widely implemented strategy to bypass the town, but it could be a potential solution to traffic in your community. Here you can see the survey results on the right where we asked the respondents to report how effectively do you think your existing transportation options are serving the needs of tourists, the local workforce, and then the needs of residents. The range goes from not effective at all to extremely effectively on either end of this graph. So you can see kind of a mix of respondents and the majority were somewhere in the middle, somewhere between moderately effective and slightly effective. So clearly some room for improvement, uh, but good things are being done. We asked the respondents to indicate what transportation options exist in the gateway communities, so or in your community. The most commonly reported transportation strategy was providing free public parking, followed by bike trails and multi-use trails, and then regional and local public transit. Uh, we've kind of found this interesting because these are small communities. So for a city of 2000 to have local public transit or regional public transit, uh, we found that fairly notable. Not uh, the other end of the scale, the least commonly uh, implemented transportation strategies are things like e-bike share programs, bike share programs, and then a bypass to reroute non-local traffic around main streets. Now, I think some of the most interesting findings from our research is looking at commute patterns across these gateway communities. So uh, I want to give everyone in this webinar a chance to explore this data on their own. So I put another QR code on the screen. Uh, you can go ahead and just scan this or follow this URL. It'll take you to a web app that we created uh, with the help from one of our graduate students, Stephanie Smith, uh, that illustrates uh, commuting patterns in a sample of these communities. And so let, let me show a little quick demonstration of that for everyone. So here is the web application. And what you're seeing are the points that represent a, a worker and where they reside. It's color coded by the community. So I'll walk through an example of how to interpret this data. So we'll zoom into where I am down here in Tucson. And so Tucson is a major ur urbanized area, so it's not a gateway community, but just about an hour and a half south, we have the city of Bisbee. And so this is a small, it's an old mining town. It's very cool. Uh, there's a lot of good art. This is a gateway community. It has access to national forests. It's a destination. And so all the workers, who have a job in Bisbee, we've color coded them this orange that you see. And the location of the point is the approximate location of their residence. So a way to interpret this is if here in the center of the map is Bisbee, people have jobs based in Bisbee, but they live in these smaller communities all around them. And so as you zoom out, you can very much see this is a, this one town is attracting workers from the entire region of this southeastern portion of Arizona, even up into Tucson. And so as you move up through Tucson and get into Phoenix, we start seeing some red dots here. And red is the color that we've chosen to represent jobs that are based in Sedona. And this is an even more popular gateway community. This one gets tourists from all over the world. So again, every dot here represents a worker that has a job based in Sedona. 
that if the dot is larger, that's more workers. And so if you zoom out across the region, you can start seeing how workers have to reside many, many miles away from these gateway communities and may commute there for their jobs. So that's what this data and this web kind of application is showing by different communities. So you can go and see your table of contents in the upper right portion of the screen. So you can see that we just chose a sample of 30 different communities to illustrate this kind of regional patterns of commuting. And so feel free to explore this map as much as you want. Uh, you can zoom around and see different communities. Here's Jackson Hole. Then you can see the people in blue commuting from all over the region to work in uh, Jackson. So this analysis of regional commuting patterns we provided to the communities that we did case studies uh, with, but I think it really highlights that these are regional issues. Uh, so if there is a growing gateway community and you aren't that gateway community, just being proximate to one, you're going to have seen an increase in population as people are that want to work in maybe the popular gateway community need an affordable place to live. So they might come and locate in that community. Looking across all our gateway communities, we found that 73% of workers in gateway communities commute over 10 minutes. Uh, this isn't that different than for urbanized areas, but it's just highlighting a lot of people are commuting. On average, 35% of the workforce in gateway communities does not live in the community that they work in. So transportation planners and engineers call this internal capture of whether people live and work in the same community. So those rates are very, very low for these communities. I want to highlight a potential um, uh, important aspect of understanding that finding is that we're using census designated places and those have very strict outlines and boundaries. And so a worker might not know where those are and they think they're in the community and they might feel like they are. But for this analysis, we just very strictly use those boundaries provided by the census. In this map, I'm kind of highlighting how far these commutes are potentially with Ketchum, Idaho in the center. And then I'm illustrating 50 mile distance bands, just kind of straight line distances. And then a, every single orange dot in this map represents a worker that has a job based in Ketchum. And this is one of the most spread out commute sheds that we saw of any of the communities that we looked at. So here's a frequency graph that shows low internal capture rates for all our communities. So you can see the highest frequency of percentage of internal capture rates was below 10%. The, the vast majority of these communities don't have a workforce that an entire workforce that lives and works in their community. And at this point, I really want to kind of highlight the data that we're using and what's good about it, how you can access it, but also some caveats to these findings so that you know how to accurately interpret these findings. Uh, we're using what's called the Longitudinal Employer Household Dynamics data set, the LOADS data. This is a Census Bureau product combined with state unemployment data. What's so cool about this data set is it shows the origin and destination of workers. So where do they reside? And then where's the location that their job is based? So we're able then to match the location of workers' residence to the location of the job. Here are the caveats to interpreting this data. One is this data, they're very concerned about confidentiality. So there's an anonymization procedure where they insert probabilistic random data. So they're putting in random data points just so that no one person could get called out and their location revealed. However, they try to do it so that if that's not dropped totally randomly, it's that point is placed where it would be likely to be found. And so it's a little bit of a synthetic data set. So uh, we just wanna be careful with that. And also the point does not necessarily mean a commute. It's simply the location of where the worker resides and where the business is located. So we kind of have to think, well, many of these are commutes and then probably some are not. So that's a little tricky and a limitation to this data. Also, it doesn't capture all industries. The construction industry is not captured and that has a huge factor in commuting patterns in rural areas. Nonetheless, it is a pretty helpful data set to visualize commute sheds and get a little bit more insight on the kind of the regional uh, aspects of your workforce commuting patterns. So uh, we think this is important uh, to show communities about this data set because on the questionnaire, we ask them, does your community understand their workforce commuting patterns? And respondents indicated a less than complete understanding of these workforce commuting patterns. So we see uh, the majority kind of were falling somewhere between somewhat and fairly well understanding of their workforce commuting patterns. And then very few said extremely well, just kind of around 7%. 
So by showing this public data and providing the tools, we're hopefully giving tools to these smaller communities to better understand their workforce commuting patterns. So in order to help do that, in partnership with our outreach initiative, the Gateway and Natural Amenity Resource Initiative, we created a blog post, and this was led by one of our graduate students funded by this research project, on how do you make a commute map? And so this is just a screen grab from this website. You can follow the URL here. And what she's done a great job of is giving step-by-step -step directions on how do you go to the census website to get this data and then quickly turn it into one of these maps that we're using because the website does work really well. We just don't think it advertises itself uh, that well. So here's how you select your community. Here's how you download the data. Here's how you display it in GIS. Uh, I think she wrote out the instructions very clearly. So if you're at least a comfortable level of GIS, you should be able to make your own commute maps for your own communities in kind of about 20, 30 minutes. So we're trying to help provide this resource to the communities as well as anyone else who's interested in learning about this data. And then since it's so clearly the, the workforce commuting patterns are regional an issue, we asked the communities, do they engage in regional planning? And they do, uh, but of course we see a range across all these communities. However, I'm gonna highlight that regional housing efforts were the least commonly reported regional planning strategy that these communities engage in. So it's down here at the bottom where a highest proportion of respondents indicated that they do not, or they are beginning to only now work on regional housing planning. And this is their most commonly reported problem. So I'm trying to just highlight that discrepancy there. A very low percentages of respondents indicated that regional planning was very effective. So I think there could be some more work in how do you do this effectively? So it's not just performative, uh, but actually it results in better planning for affordable housing and workforce commuting. And then I'm just briefly gonna highlight here too, is we ask these communities what planning tools and strategies they use. And not surprisingly, we see the general or comprehensive plan is the most commonly used and most effective, followed by community visions and natural disaster and hazard plans. And then the least commonly implemented planning strategy is an affordable housing plan. And again, I'm drawing this out because again, that provision of affordable housing is the most widespread and severe challenge these communities face, yet there are, they're not really developing affordable housing plans. So clearly this would link back into a lack of uh, time and funding and capacity. So we're hoping our research can help to develop best practices for affordable housing plans in these types of communities. And then finally, how did COVID-19 impact these communities? So we asked the public officials their perspective on changes in population after the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's pretty clear they reported growth across the board. So 45% of respondents said that the population of year-round residents is higher or much higher. A little more than 60% said that the population of tourists was higher or much higher. And, but interestingly, no one said that the population of their seasonal residents was much higher in their community. So after looking at all these results, and again, acknowledging that we have a wide range of communities, I think the Zoom town phenomenon was very much a subset of our total sample. So some communities saw that massive boom in um, kind of uh, new residents coming there to live but not work, but this is certainly not in every single rural community that we were interviewing. So the Zoom towns are likely a subset of our total sample, and this leads nicely into kind of what we're going to be working on in the next couple of months. Our next steps of this research are to develop a gateway typology, or we want to better differentiate the different types of gateway communities. So at the beginning of this webinar, I talked about we kind of cast a wide net and we have this big category of gateway communities, but we know they're not all the same. So we're trying to then look at how are they different and then maybe tailor strategies and um, to those types of categories. We, this was reinforced with our questionnaire. We would get some write-in responses that are similar to this one where we would ask a set of questions and the respondents would say, none of this is applicable for our town. So we knew this going in, uh, but we still think that there, um, these communities may have the potential to turn into gateway communities. So we still want to study them. We're just thinking about this more as a development trajectory where these communities fall at different places along that trajectory. And I think this is starting to be supported by the data as I'm showing in this table. Uh, we've grouped the gateway communities according to how many amenities are approximate. So is there only one natural amenity within 10 miles or are there over five? 
And the clear trend that's so interesting with this data is the more amenities there are, the higher the population growth rate, the higher the median household income, the higher the per capita income, the higher the percent second home ownership, the higher the median home value, and then the higher the median gross rent. So the more amenities they get, then probably they're facing greater and greater growth pressures. So we're going to be working on this to really refine this analysis and put this out in the next couple of months. So just another little visualization of that here, I think it's going to reveal that there are regions uh, that are going to have more amenities and they these communities in these kind of hotspot regions might have a different set of tools and strategies that they need to implement, other than some of these communities that may only have one or two natural amenities and far less growth pressures. Or far fewer growth pressures. So finally, I want to end this webinar by providing some resources that our research has created. Uh, we have two NITSI reports. Uh, this one that I was presenting on today should be posted shortly. We just completed it. Uh, and then I'm providing the URL for our previous one that we did in 2018. So both of those, you've got all our survey results and our case study results in case you want more detail. Uh, we also have an article in the Journal of American and the Planning Association that summarizes this, re summarizes this research and then is very much tailored for the planning audience. And then I wanna point you all towards the Gateway Natural Amenity Resource Initiative. Uh, this is housed at the Utah State University, uh, but this is a network of communities and researchers uh, for sharing information. So you could go to this URL, sign up for free, and then you can uh, learn about different webinars, workshops, uh, best practices. We're trying to use this uh, initiative as our outreach for our research. So if this seems relevant to your community or important, please go ahead and go over there and join that network and hopefully that will be helpful. So I just wanna end this webinar by thanking the research team. I'm, I'm the presenter today, uh, but this was the product of a team of, of faculty and students. So Danya, Stephanie, Ethan, and Zachariah. Uh, Stephanie, Ethan, and Zachariah are students. They really contributed a lot to this project and I'm happy to present their results as well. And then Lacey and Becca, Becca with NITSI made all this very easy to set up, so I appreciate their efforts as well. And so I'd be happy at this time uh, for the rest of our webinar time uh, to try to answer any questions that anyone has. Great, thanks, Philip. Looks like we've got a couple questions in the Q&A. Uh, the first one is someone requesting the ArcGIS map link, if you're able to drop that in the chat. Yeah, let's do that. Cool. Um, and the second question I believe may have been answered live. It says, does the findings report demonstrate how the commuting patterns map was done? Would love to use this for some affordability studies. Um, I think you did go over that, but if-, if the... oh, oh, I can gladly clarify that. Yeah, we one of our goals was to teach people how to do this. So yeah, are we, I've, um, I can go back here real quick. It's too hard. So we did a uh, um, um, graduate student at the University of Arizona named Stephanie Smith did an online blog on our Gateway and Natural Amenity Resource Initiative website. And so here is the URL and I can put that one into the, that into the chat as well. But what's nice about this is she did step-by-step -step instructions for how do you go to the website? How do you select your community? How do you download the data? And then how do you put it into GIS to display it? So uh, this is public data. <laughs> Again, I don't think they advertise it very well. Uh, so we're trying to help them out with that so that this is a good resource. And then I would just uh, highlight again, uh, there are some caveats to this data. So it's kind of a complex data set with this idea that they're inserting noise in order to add confidentiality, but we are treating it as it is mostly true. Great. Um, next question. Does the findings report, oh, sorry, I already read that one. <laughs> Your commute sheds show an appreciable percentage of workers living many hours away from their workplace. I assume this means that these folks aren't commuting in the usual sense. Uh, what relationship exists for these workers? Good question. Yeah. You see them where it's like in Sedona, there's a job in Seattle. Uh, there's no way they're doing a daily commute. Uh, but that could mean, all, all it means is that there is a business in Sedona that through their state unemployment records indicated that they have an employee whose primary residence is in that city. So I think when we start getting outside of like a multiple hour drive, we, I think it's a safe assumption there is not daily commuting going on. 
However, that doesn't mean that the person who's, that's, that's what the data is telling us. There is a job based in the community, and then based on unemployment state records, there is a, a worker that resides at that address. And so I think the commuting probably occurs within that hour and a half to two hour range. And we know for a fact that many, much of the workforce in these small rural communities does commute that long. Uh, when we looked up the average for metropolitan areas, the average commute time was not that different than for rural communities, uh, but then the distances are quite di uh, different. So in a metropolitan area, you might be stuck in traffic and not going that far, that increases your commute time. In some of these rural areas, you're driving at 65 miles per hour for that same amount of time. So the distance is much longer, and that would also influence the travel costs as well. Hmm, makes sense. Uh, next question. Some gateway communities are only gateways, but some communities are destinations themselves, for example, Moab. Do you make that distinction in your analysis? And if so, can you talk about that? No, I disagree entirely with that idea. Uh, and so when, as we're we really want to create this gateway typology. It's, it's, uh, we're working on it. And one thing that'll be really hard for us to measure is the quality of those amenities. So right now we can count the total number of amenities and show that if there's more amenities, it seems to have higher growth pressures and we're seeing higher second home ownership, higher median incomes, and some of these kind of indicators. Um, but we're not going to quickly be able in GIS to measure the quality of these amenities because that's more subjective and that varies according to people. Um, but yeah, Moab itself is a destination to go. However, it's got rivers, national parks, and national forests around it. So hopefully we're capturing a little bit of that just by measuring the count of the natural amenities, as opposed to some of these other very rural communities that aren't experiencing the growth pressures. They might be located on a wild and scenic river or near a national forest, but they um, we still want to consider those communities because they have the potential to grow into these more developed ones, but they're just not at that point along the development trajectory. So I think we're going to have a real hard time with measuring quality, uh, but this typology analysis, I, I, we'll keep that in mind of can we measure places that are more than gateways that are destinations in, in themselves. So I agree with that comment. Great. Um, did you look at any Eastern U.S. gateway communities? No, but we have a colleagues uh, uh, from the Eastern state that are constantly reminding us that we should expand our uh, understanding of this term. And so, so far we've kept it just to the Western states primarily because there are so many national parks and there's so much public land and so much state or sorry, national forests and Bureau of Land Management land. And then the distances between these communities and the large metropolitan areas is much greater in the West than in the Eastern cities. So we right now are just looking at the Western uh, gateway communities, but when we go to con when we go to the uh, ACSP conference, APA conferences, we're always hearing from uh, people in the Eastern states that say this makes a lot of sense for this community. So we're limited to just the Western states for our analysis, but that doesn't mean we don't think that there's lessons that could be learned or that there are some similarities. Mm -hmm. uh, someone wanted to know what did the asterisks represent on the slide about number of affinities amended? Oh, yeah. Those are the results of my analysis of variance. And so that is a statistical test that measures uh, are there differences between the groups? And what we found is that there were differences between each of these groups. And then the number of stars is my shorthand for indicating where those differences exist. So for this row, the median home value, it's only this group four is different than group one. That's what the asterisk indicates in terms of statistical significance. I think there's a meaningful difference here, but the sample size of this little, uh, this group four is so much smaller that the analysis of variance, it, it still, it could be due to chance that there is a difference. I think if we could increase our sample size or if I change these groups, uh, it looks like a meaningful difference to me. So I think with a larger sample size, the ANOVA would indicate uh, and it's the post hoc tests uh, for the detail of which groups are different. So we're we're doing the post hoc test, and that's what the asterisks indicate there. Uh, this is very draft uh, early analysis, so we'll have it real polished when we put it into an academic journal article. Uh, next question: Does affordable housing mean subsidized housing or workforce missing middle housing? 
Good question. We are using, so the construct of affordable housing, uh, we're operationalizing that in the broadest terms possible. This is the public official's interpretation of the word affordable housing. So we did not provide any definition or nuance to what is affordable housing versus workforce housing versus subsidized. This would have been interpreted by the public officials, however they think about it. Mm -hmm. Um, someone requesting that you share the questionnaire link again. Oh, of course. And then let's see, while you're putting that in the chat, I will look at the next questions. Um, someone just wanted to point out that the commute data might be showing seasonal workers who don't do daily commutes for the data source. I don't know if you want to comment on that. Yeah, what I'd like to do there then is go find those data. Add that to the caveats. Uh, it's, it's seasonal workers could be reflected in this data set. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree with that comment, absolutely. And so I'll just highlight one other thing. When we were talking with these communities of what, about what data sources they use to understand commute patterns, the communities that had the best understanding were purchasing cell phone data. And so that was another alternate data source to get a better understanding of this. But this is a, that's pretty costly. When our research budget didn't have the money for it. Uh, so will a small rural community always have the money to work with a consultant to buy that cell phone data? Um, that I, I think would be a good, if, if possible, there'd be no harm in buying that cell phone data to then be one other source of commuting patterns use the loads data, and then maybe one other source to try to tri triangulate on what is the true commuting patterns. Mm -hmm. um, with the discrepancy between housing needs and housing planning, I'm wondering if you are compiling strategies for the housing shortage issue, such as state regulations, et cetera. I think so far we're at the stage where we have identified communities that are implementing certain strategies. We haven't collected those documents or any of those ordinances or those strategies. And so what I think the Gateway and Natural Amenity Initiative, the outreach uh, kind of arm of this research at the Utah State University, is trying to create those kind of peer-to-peer -peer learning groups to share those a little bit more. Right now, most of our research has been gathering data on perceptions of these communities. Uh, trying to uh, measure challenges and then measure changes. So what, what, where we're aiming, as well as better understanding of typology of gateway communities, is can we create these uh, collections of best practices, of sample ordinances, and sharing that data more widely? We're, we're not quite all the way there yet. All right, we have, we have one question left. If anyone has any lingering questions, do go ahead and put them into the Q&A. Um, the last question here is many of the issues faced by NARS are faced by many small rural communities. Have you done any analysis to see what is unique for NARS from non-NARS? We did. Uh, so uh, after our initial analysis and applying that criteria to what constitutes a NAR or what doesn't, uh, there are far more gateway communities than there are just rural communities. And the big difference is how much agriculture is going on. And so a lot of our rural communities that are not proximate to a national forest or state park or anything like that. They're very agricultural communities. And so we compared land cover differences between those. So the amount of agricultural land around these rural communities that are not gateways uh, is a high, far higher proportion of agricultural land than the gateway communities. Um, I think if we're thinking about this as a spectrum of kind of how gateway are you, uh, we could absolutely include all rural communities and that would just be one end of the spectrum. Uh, we, when we compared commuting times, uh, the gateway communities may have had a slightly shorter commuting time than other rural areas. So it's, again, we're, we are trying to struggle with this, where does the gateway community begin versus where is it just a purely agricultural rural community? Mm -hmm. um, someone is asking to just briefly give an overview of Zoom towns. Oh yeah, so that, that was the popular little buzzword uh, when the pandemic hit. And so newspaper articles uh, and uh, media started kind of framing it in those terms. So I think a Zoom town was during the pandemic, workers from cities decided to either do long-term rentals or buy property in some of these communities and then 
to continue, they didn't change their jobs. They continued to work at their job, but just remotely. And that's, I think, where the term Zoom town comes from. And from the perspective of someone who could do that, you could go live in your favorite community. You take your high earnings from a metropolitan area and you bring it to a rural area. Your buying power in that housing market is going to be pretty impressive. And so they could buy very desirable housing, continue to make that metropolitan income, and that's going to influence that community if it happens enough uh, and over time. That'll change the housing dynamics by increasing housing costs, and it will displace people working in that community where that community just can't provide that income that, say, someone working in downtown Seattle or San Francisco is going to earn. Uh, just there aren't jobs like that necessarily in rural areas. Mm -hmm. Um, someone wants to know, can you please restate which communities you shared your findings with? Oh, um, with the, the first NITSE report, uh, that, that's been out for a few years, uh, and then the Journal of the JAPA article has been out, so that's been some of our outreach uh, through that Gateway and Natural Amenity Resource Initiative, or the NAR Initiative through Utah State University. Uh, I don't have the numbers uh, with that. But they are doing weekly blog posts. There are weekly workshops. There are, have been a lot of, that's where a lot of our outreach with the communities go. So I know when we administered our questionnaire uh, to that email list, there were 400 emails on that work, uh, on that initiative list. And most of those would have been public officials or researchers in this field. Uh, so that that's kind of a rough ballpark. So certainly not all the communities, but there is a maybe kind of a third to hopefully 50% are generally aware of this research, but we're trying to expand that as well. Mm -hmm. um, some employers requiring employees to return to in-person work. Have you seen the effects of this in any data yet, or have some communities seen the effects of this? No, uh, -uh. and so we've, our survey went out this time last year. So we were kind of the, the, I don't know when the end of the pandemic, when we can draw that line or what have you, uh, but no. Uh, our survey went out last year and it contained no questions about uh, and are they seeing like a deflation of the balloon? Uh, we haven't measured that. And the census data is still catching up to measure that objectively as well. Mm -hmm. um, someone also asks if you could just briefly share more about the concept of rural gentrification. Oh, yeah. So that so here's something I think we could do a will be something for us to improve upon is how we use that term and how we measure it. Uh, because in general, what we're seeing in some of these communities, the ones that are growing very quickly, is we are seeing an increase in the cost of housing and then a displacement of the workforce. And so that, that observation based on the data is could be considered a form of gentrification. And we were hearing about that anecdotally and from our interviews as well. Um, that might be the extent to which we have measured and operationalized the concept of uh, gentrification. Great, thank you. Um, if, oh, someone pointed out that on the NAR initiative, currently the list is at 700, so it's like- Oh, that. good, okay, so good. This is, we want it to grow. Uh, and so we've been pushing on this research for about four years. Uh, so it does take a little time to build that inertia. And so, again, the NITSE support has been critical to this, and uh, all of us are continuing to work on it. All right. Um, it looks like the Q&A is wrapped up, and we are right at about 11. So thank you, everyone, for your questions, and thanks for a great presentation, Philip, and thanks, everyone, for joining us. Yeah, and thank you for all the good questions and comments and uh, the, for attending this webinar. Okay. All right. Thank you.